Hello, welcome to another edition of Hangout with the Mandated Prophet. Wow, the kind of comments and responses we got last week as we heard this telecast was amazing. People were blessed and there were a lot of uh, responses to what we shared last week. I believe that God has designed this program to be a blessing to you and to meet you at a point of your needs. Today, promises to be explosive. Please, I would like you to comment at the comment section. Share this video. Invite your friends. Tell them it's time again to eat from the plate of unusual revelation and that God is up to something in your life. Today, we are going to be looking at the subject, understanding the language of God understanding the language of God and before we go on I would like to read a text from the book of John chapter 10 and verse 27 the word of the Lord declares that Jesus said and I know my sheep and my sheep hears my voice and him they shall follow Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 the Bible declares that as many as they are that are led by the Spirit, that they are the sons of God. So, the thought from these two scriptures, it can be established that God is a communicator and not a talkative. God communicates. God speaks. From Genesis to Revelation, the scripture is loaded with insights on various occasions where God spoke to men and men aligned to the inherence of his voice and they became generational wonders. I'm also coming to us now we are under the New, Dis New Testament dispensation. It is our kingdom, heritage and birthright to hear God. Every child of God must hear God and be led by the Spirit. As many as they are that are call the sons of God must be led. So, ability to hear God's voice and be led by the spirits is the cardinal mark of sonship. I say that again. Ability to hear God and be led by his spirit is a cardinal mark of sonship in this kingdom. So, the question is, does God speak? Yes, he speaks. But, of course, you need to grow and learn by the wisdom of God how he speaks to you personally and how he communicates generally. God doesn't speak to everyone the same. There are different modes of transmission of his thoughts and his in, you know, intent and uh, it behoves on you as a believer to be able to find out how God speaks to you and how you can be able to increase that understanding in order to work in precision and in accuracy as it relates to discerning the voice of God. You know, in one of the editions, I spoke about discerning the Spirit of God and what you need. And I would like you to go through my wall and get that tape. It's going to be a blessing to you how to discern the voice of God and how to guard against, uh, you know, mischievous elements in the body of Christ who are polluting the altars of men's heart and bringing words that does not have prophetic content and does not have the signature of divinity. So today we are looking at understanding the language of God. God speaks. God communicates. He is not a talkative, but he communicates. At various points in history, moving according to the dispensational dealing of God with man, we have been able to see that he spoke to man. And when man responded on the integrity of what was heard, there was a generational shift and there was no usual impact. One of the cardinal secrets of Jesus' impact on earth was the ability to hear God's voice and ability to be led by the Spirit. And I would like you to know in this dispensation, you don't just go to, be, to the prophet to be led by the Spirit. You will know God for yourself and He will lead you. How does God lead? He leads by the Spirit. He leads by His voice. And there are some of the things we are going to be examining today. So please, tighten up your seatbelt, invite your friends, share this video as I take this course deeper. So, 
I'm able to establish the fact that God communicates, but he's not a talkative. He speaks in various languages that as a child of God, as a believer, you must be able to grow to discern how God speaks to you specifically. So, starting today, we are going to be looking at vision. Acts chapter 2, 17 to 18, the Bible says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, and sons and daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see vision. That is it. The young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. So, vision is one of the cardinal ways through which God speaks to the saints. The, 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 the impact of the the flow of God in the scripture is replete with endless account of men who saw visions and their life we accelerated. Now, when we talk about vision, we have two kinds of vision. Number one is what we call the vision of the mind. Remember that man is tripartite. Man is a spirit, a man has a soul, a man lives in a body. With the spirit, we make contact with God, with the mind, we enter into the reins of intellectualism, and with the body, we make contact with the five sense realm. But when a man's mind comes under the subjugation of the intensity of the word and the operations of the Holy Spirit, it can become a safe guide for divine guidance and divine leading. I said that again. When a man's mind is renewed and what well, you know is brought onto you know divine subjugation to the intensity of the word of God and the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, it can be trusted as a sure guide for discerning the inerrancy of God's voice. So, vision of the man is like God projecting a picture, a sanctified picture on your mind in order to communicate some certain purposes and plans. Now hear this, if you are not born again, you shouldn't trust this as a sure way of God speaking to you because your mind must be under the radar of the world. Paul said, let us renew our mind. And how do we renew it? By renewing it by the word. So it should be, it must be a world sanctified mind if we must trust it as a as a medium through which god speaks for example if i ask you to picture an elephant from the eyes of your mind you could easily picture an elephant and many a times the holy spirit draws a picture on the walls of your mind to you know to describe or to communicate what he wants to say so like i said we have two kinds of vision Number one is what I call the vision of the man where the Holy Spirit used the instrumentality of a mind that is sanctified and redeemed and cleansed by the world subjected under the scrutiny of the Holy Ghost and he begins to paint pictures of divine possibilities. That's it. Secondly, still under vision, we have what we call open vision. This is what you see while your physical eyes are open. God supernaturally opens your eyes and you see into the realm of the Spirit. We all remember the scripture that spoke about um, Elisha and his servant. When invaders surrounded their abode and the young man cried and said, Hey, hey, master, these people want to destroy us. They destroy us. And the only prayer Elisha prayed said, Oh Lord, open his eyes. And we heard that immediately he prayed that prayer that the, the servant's eyes were open and he saw that surrounding that particular place of abode were angels on chariot of fire. So God can supernaturally, this is what we call open vision, God can supernaturally open your eyes and bring you into intimate operation. We saw a lot of people that saw vision. In, John, in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, John in the island of the Patmos said, I was in the Lord's spirit and I had a voice. That's vision, supernatural vision. So, you should be able to covet this. You should be able to trust God 
It's not something you seek, but it's something that you must believe. And uh, in the process of seeking God, He gives the vision. Most at times, a lot of folks in Christendom want to produce vision. And uh, if you want to produce vision without the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you enter into the realms of divination. So, visions, God is the giver of vision. And it's possible to pray and get answer without having vision. There is no way it is written in the Bible that you must have vision in order to indicate how spiritual you are. So vision is something that the Holy Spirit is supplied according as He wills, according you know, according to His the way He wills. Uh, if He wills to give you vision, He will give you vision. But if He doesn't want to give you vision, it's not something you break your head. He is the one that gives vision. Praise the Lord. Number two, we talk about dreams. Dreams is dreams are also a language of the spirit. And when we talk about dreams, we have some kinds of dreams, like about three kinds of dreams. Praise the Lord. We have about three kinds of dreams. Number one is what we call revelational dreams. This is the kind of dream that uh, Joseph, the father of Jesus, had. We had the angel of God in instructed him to take the child to Egypt because. Uh, Herod will be looking for how to kill him. Okay, you see that account in Matthew chapter 2, 13 and 14. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word. Matthew 2, 13 and 14. This kind of dream, they are revelational dreams. This is where God invades your night sleep. And communicates deep thoughts and communicates things that is or things that is to come. Okay, the second kind of dream is what we call thought induced dream. This is the kind of dream that comes as an aftermath of events that took place in the day or a constant thought that has overshadowed your life for a time. For example, you, you are planning to take an exam and you go to bed and you begin to sleep about. I begin to dream about where you are, you know, writing exams and all that. So it is because Bible calls it through the multitude of business. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 3. For a dream coming through the multitude of business unto a fool's voice, and a fool's voice is known by a multitude of words. So these are the projections that come from your thoughts when you sleep. They begin to replay into your imagination and if you are not sound, you might misconstrue them to be revelation. No, they are projections from your mental realm. So we call that thought-induced dreams. Another kind of dream we have is what we call satanic manipulated dreams. This is a satanically driven, dream, uh, driven dream projected into one's life for the purpose of injuring or causing destruction in the person's life. For example, Satan projects you into your subconscious and you dream where you had an accident and the next day you had an accident. That is not the will of God. The will of God for the child of God is longevity. The will of God for the child of God is fruitfulness. Any dream that is in contradiction with the reading will of God for you is not from God. For I know the thought that I think of you, Jeremiah 29 verse 11, the thought of good, the thought of peace, and to bring you to an acceptable end. So, satanic inspired dreams are dreams that are programmed to bring you injury or to bring you disaster. And what do you do? Once you wake up, you break that cycle and you take authority over it by the power of the Holy Ghost. A lot of people have become victims of this because they were not in charge. They were not taught. They were not learned. Any prophetic word that is not in tandem with God's will for your life must be broken. Every word is a carrier of a certain spirit and a certain life. And if you allow them to have a landing space in your subconscious, like a seed, they are going to have multiple habits given to time. So once you wake up from dream, and you have dreams that are anti your purpose, that are anti God's words to you, you must have to nip them in the bud 
by breaking their cycle and taking authority over them by the power of the Holy Ghost. Some believers have said that I saw it get to... No, it wasn't God. It's not God's way for you to die on the road. It's not God's way for you to have accident. It's not God's way for you to be buried. It's not God's way for you to be having, you know, eating with people that have died. It's not God's way. Those dreams are manipulated. And once you are lying in agreement with them, they come to pass. So, you must be able to know to discern these things. And the dream and the prophetic can never be at the same level. It can only be prophetic when it is properly interpreted. These are some basic facts you need to know, you need to know about dreams. Dreams must be properly interpreted before it can equate prophecy. For example, you must be able to interpret colors, numbers, symbolic occurrences in dreams before you can be able to say, okay, this is prophecy. So, the, in as much as dream is a major language of God, but we must grow in mastery on how to interpret dreams. Don't run with a dream that is not properly interpreted. And the Holy Spirit, if it's the inspiration behind it, can always be saw in the, in, in the Bible about Joseph, the, the dream interpreter. If you ask him to give you interpretation to dreams and he doesn't have it, you will say, give me time. I saw that in Joseph, I saw that in Daniel. So it's important we must realize that we must trust God for interpretation before we can be able to equate dream as prophetic oppression or as prophecy. How again does God speak? God speaks through small, still voice. Small, still voice. God speaks in a small, still voice from within our spirit. Remember, at redemption, our spirit is fused in an unbreakable relationship with the Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27 says that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord and through it he searches the inward parts of the belly. So what that means is that God will speak to you and lead you by your spirit that is in fusion with the Holy Spirit. Paul said, for he that is joined with another have become one. So you are joined with the Holy Ghost. So God's this small voice is God's voice coming from the portals of your recreated human spirit. We saw in the book of 1 Kings 19, 11 to 13, I'm not going to read it, where Elijah was uh, expecting God's voice. He saw fire. God's voice was not in fire. He saw earthquake. God's voice was not there. And when he almost gave up hope and he heard God's voice talking in a still small voice. God still speaks in a still small voice today. You must be able to lay off childhood situations, riotous situations around the templates of your spirit. A man that must hear God must maintain a level of quietude around the embers of the portals of his human spirit because actually it is a human spirit that is empowered specifically to pick these details from the dimensions of divinity. So if you are riotous, your mind is on one place, it will be very difficult because some of these things can be very, 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 you know, I mean, what I mean by that, it, it, it can be lost. If you are not sensitive, it can be lost. So it needs a level of quietude, it needs a level of sensitivity for you to pick this signal. So God speaks to the saints through God's still small voice. And this grace and ability is still available to us that are saints in the body of Christ today. So I will encourage you to begin to take a study of yourself. Ask God, how do you speak to me? How can I hear your voice? Because like I said, ability to hear God's voice and be led by His Spirit is number one cardinal revelation of sonship. If you can't hear the voice of your father, you are not a son, you are a stranger. Sons will hear the voice of their father. Can I hear you shout hallelujah? So it's important you must establish the, 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 the 
the fact that God still speaks through his still small voice. Continuing, God speaks through angels. Angelic operations are still real. It didn't end with the death and ascension of Christ into heaven. It didn't end with the early apostles' ministry. In fact, we are told in Hebrew that these angels, they are ministers to those who shall be the hands of salvation. So angelic intervention, angelic communication is still real. When you see there is something a pitfall we must nip in the fall. Angels are not meant to be worshipped. Angels are our errand boys. Angels confirm the words we speak in order to exercise dominion. I mean, it makes a mismatch of God's intention when saints begin to bow down. So in Revelation, when John in the island of Patmos wanted to prostrate for the angel, the angel rebuked him. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm your fellow servant who stand in the presence of God, bringing you these glad tidings. So angels are our servant. They hear our word and they bat our desire. So many a times you God sends angels to bring answer to our prayer. We saw in, in, in <laughs> it's a common scripture where God sent an angel and uh, to come to talk to Daniel and he was well laid and all that. But what I want to bring from that, I don't want to go into the theology of that scripture, but what I want to say is that God can send an angel to communicate to you and to give you an can give you an answer. Hebrews 1 verse 14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heads of salvation? Engage, engage your angels. Provoke your angels. God can do all these things. He can communicate, but you need to be sensitive to be able to deceive her. At times they wear a human body and appear, but you need to. Was it not what uh, 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 Abraham saw in Genesis 18? He was able to decode that these guys are angels and he received them and they brought it and they brought news from heaven and that was the end of barrenness that was the end of barrenness he has not ended as he was yesterday that's how he is today and forever he shall be so that operation is still on today so god can still speak to us even in acts of the apostle in acts of the apostle 12 6 to 7 let's see what the bible says and when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the other side, and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chain fell off from his hand. So the scripture is replete with accounts of how God sent angels to bring a word. It was an angel that came to Manoah, the father of Samson, to communicate about the birth of Samson. I mean, the Bible was the angel that announced the birth of Jesus. And so all these things are still applicable to us, especially when our focus is on God and his word. He can decide to send an angel to communicate to us. Praise the Lord. Another way through which God communicates to us is what I call trances. It's what I call trances. A trance is another way through which God speaks to his people. Trances are much like visions. Hear this. Trances are much like visions, except that when we are in a trance, we are completely unaware of our surroundings. Hear this. Trances are much like visions, except that when we are in trances, we are completely unaware of our surroundings. The word trance in the Greek rendition means to be out of your mind. Momentarily, you, you cannot be able to pick where you are, what is happening. You are surrounded by that divine oppression. We saw in Acts chapter 10, 9 to 11. On the morrow, as they were on their journey and drew near unto the city, Peter went up 
upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance. I said it again. He fell into a trance and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descended unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down for the earth. So trance or trances are still a major way through which God speaks to us. So what we need to do is to continue walking. Why am I giving you an expanded dimension? Well, it doesn't speak to every believer the same way. Yet, he can speak to us through what witness. But there are other dimensions. You know, we cannot stereotype God that he must talk to me in this way. At times, he can give you vision. At times, he can give you sanctified dreams. At times, he can be trans. At times, he can be angelic intervention. He has that. That's what I'm teaching you today. All I want you to take out is to be sensitive and to know that God still communicates. He does not keep us in the dark concerning his doings as he relates to the end time program. Praise the Lord. Another way through which God speaks to us is what we call the scripture. The scripture came by the authorship and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Every scripture is inspired. The Bible speaking about it in Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and 17. The Bible declares all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The word inspiration means God breathed. That means every word of God contains life. Jesus said in the book of John 6 and verse 63, He said, For the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. In other words, these words are prophetically inspired. And is profitable for doctrine. The scripture is profitable for doctrine. The scripture is profitable for reproof for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 17, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. So the Lord can speak to us through the scripture. Of course, principally, the Bible is divided into Logos, which means the written word, and the Rema, which means the revealed word. When we study the general counsel of God's word, it is God's love letter to us that is declaring his will, his intention, and his purpose for us as believers. But of course, there comes a time you'll be reading a particular stream of thought and a word stands out from that place. That is God speaking to you in the now from the dimension of the Rema word. So God's Rema word is God's specific word given to a believer to meet a present need. I say that again. God's rhema word is God's specific word given to a believer to meet a present need. I tell you a story. I had a story of um, some young girls in South Korea who were believers and they had a story of how Peter walked on the top of waters. So one day after school, they say, oh, Today we are going to exercise our faith. God is powerful. If Peter could walk on the face of the rivers, we too can replicate the same. And uh, the story had it that these three youngers went to the river and they tried exercising their faith and they got drowned. Now the question is, is the biblical account not real? It is real. But the distinction is that the word, the rhema was not given to the young, the, 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 the young girls. The rhema was specifically tailored to Peter. So that should tell you, you don't live by another man's rhema. You live by the rhema spoken to you specifically by God. That is why when young ministers go to ministries and copy and copy stereotypes and, and systems and uh, they, they, get, they get worried that after three, four years, that they're not producing the kind of result from the parent church where they copied it from. No! Everybody must know God for himself. For those that know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploit. Even when you copy, you must trust the Holy Spirit to make it adaptable to your person and in tandem with God's current plan concerning you and the ministry has called you to vendor. So at every moment as we are studying the scripture, and if you want to have eruptions of rhema, 
let us give ourselves to continuous studying of the word. Take studying to a deeper level called meditation. When meditation of God's word breaks into the spirit, it produces light. Your word is a light unto my path. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. They enter. They, how does the word enter? By meditation. We can call that spiritual regurgitation. When the spirit man begins to break down the molecules and the particles of the word of God, it translates into light. And this light is what gives you flight in destiny. Paul said in Galatians chapter 2 verse 2, the an I Paul, I went up by revelation, revelation of the word. So it becomes pertinent that we must give an unbridled attention to the world. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. The disciples said, But we shall give ourselves continually, continually to the ministry of the word and of prayer. So God speaks to us from the scripture. The scripture is printed of God. The scripture is inspired. It carries the life, the nature of God. And when we give attention to the word of God, he speaks to us daily. Praise the Lord. Number five, uh, God speaks to us through tongues. Tongues from God are both a gift and a blessing. The, 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 the gift of speaking in tongues is an initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Of course, you need to know there is a distinction between the new birth and the Holy Ghost baptism. A lot of people can draw this line. At the point of redemption, you have a measure of the Spirit. But the Holy Ghost baptism gets you filled to a deeper dimension. It now becomes a river. Jesus said, out of your belly shall come rivers of life giving water. At new birth, it becomes simply a well. And this well is just for personal edification and devotion. But at a river dimension, it becomes a ceaseless flow through which the power of God comes out of you to be a blessing to people and for an equipment for kingdom service. So, at the point of redemption, the Holy Spirit is the power behind the impartation of the life and nature of Christ, a measure of it. But that is not their reach to the fullness of, of, of God's power. So you need what we call the Holy Ghost baptism. And the initial, if you study the account of Paul to the Ephesians church, and Peter in the house of Colonius in Acts chapter 2, the Bible said on the day of the Pentecost, the Spirit of God came upon them and they spoke in new tongues. They spoke in new tongues. So one of the cardinal initial evidence that a man has been endued and baptized with the power of the Holy Ghost is the ability to speak in tongues. Paul said, I thank my God that I speak in tongues more than you. It is a divine equipment. Tongues is not the Holy Ghost speaking through you. Tongues means Holy Spirit giving your spirit utterance. It is your spirit that speaks. Your spirit utters mystery. But that is made available or you know you are able to function in it because the Holy Spirit gives you utterance. He gives you enablement to give expression to what he puts in your recreated human spirit. So tongues on, on its own it's not enough to be a middle to which God communicates. You must go with another gift that we call the interpretation of tongues. You can ask God for it. Paul said, let's convert these giftings. So when a man gives, that's for personal edification and must be publicly guided in the place of private devotion. But in public ministry, there must be need, if you want to exert that as a mode of communication, there must be need to bring meaning to what the Holy Spirit is communicating through your spirit by giving you your utterance. So there must be another complementary gift that is called the gift of interpretation. The gift of interpretation. So by that operation, we can say tongues plus interpretation of tongues equals prophecy. You didn't get me. We can say tongues plus interpretation of tongues equals prophecy. By prophecy, I mean the simple gift of prophecy 
that operates on the levels of edification, on the levels of comfort, and the levels of exaltation. So every child of God must trust God to speak in tongues. Bible encourages us to speak without ceasing. There's no way you can pray without ceasing except you speak un unusually, intermittently with tongues anywhere you are in the park, in the house, in the office. Yama Santo, Obranes, Ilaho, Kayam de Limbre. You can even be talking without anybody by yourself knowing you're communicating. By so doing, you are maintaining consistency. But you can as well trust God for interpretation. Yes, you can have it. You watching me right now, you can have it. He can as well give you interpretation, and that becomes the prophecy operation. That becomes a medium through which God communicates to you. As I begin to wrap it up, there is another major way through which God speaks to every believer. I read a story of Kennedy Hagen in 19, I think 1959, uh, Jesus' visitation to him, and Jesus said to him that. Uh, one of the cardinal ways through which he will always lead all believers is what we call inward impression or inward witness. Inward impression or inward witness. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. The Bible said, The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I take that again. The Spirit himself, King James said itself, but the Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a living personality. He has emotion. He can speak. He can be grieved. So the right rendition should be the Holy Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Romans 8.16 Many prophetic people experience discernment through impressions without even realizing it. This is God putting strong impressions in your spirit. This is God raising a prophetic instruction by impinging it on the words of your spirit. That is that knowing that you know that you cannot be argued. Many a times they are very slimy in operation that you need extra sensitivity to know it. For example, you could meet a man for the first time and suddenly you are careful. You've not had anything prior to that meeting. That is a word impression telling you there is a red flag. You need to be careful. Every believer enjoys this privilege. It is number one pivotal way through which God can speak to every believer. In word impression, we call it a peace of the spirit. And we know that peace is the umpire for divine guidance. Maybe you want to travel tomorrow and you don't have peace about it. You start feeling as if you are going to have an accident. There are times my wife will start smelling blood. And if you, need, you hear that somebody has had an accident, has, has, has accident somewhere. He speaks to us in various ways. At times, the, the, I, I, I think of somebody and I get angry. And I can discern that that person has spoken, to, spoken against me in a way that is not defined. Or you can come into a, a room and suddenly you are agitated. Suddenly you are angry. That is a word witness. That is Holy Spirit impinging on the words of your woman spirit. There are some words. You know what? I mean, if you come into a kitchen where they fry fish, you will agree with me that even after some minutes, the smell of the fish will still be handled in the atmosphere. So once you come into the kitchen, definitely you will know that fish has, you know, has been fried. So it is with words. So it is. So when you come in a place where they have spoken against you, or that you will sense it in your spirit. And that is a major way. As many as they are that are the sons of God, they are being led. He wants to lead you. He wants to speak to you. Our God is not an idol. Our God is a living God. As he is yesterday, say he is today and forever he shall be. Why is this man of God teaching about the language of God? I want to establish the fact that the God of the Bible is a living God. He spoke yesterday. He's speaking today and forever is a speaking God. The Bible says God who at sundry times has spoken to our father, but now he's speaking to us by his son. So God is a speaking God. And if you are born again, sanctified, spirit filled, I mean, you don't go, you don't need to go to any prophet to mess you up. No, 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 no. Right there, you I always tell my son, I say, you are the number one prophet of your life. What I can do is to bring confirmation or to mentor you, to vet you, 
You'll be able to know when it is God and when it is not God. So, I want to encourage you today. Give yourself to more learning. Give yourself to more, more studying. Live a spirit-filled life because he created. Avoid distraction. One of the secrets of hearing God is speaking in tongues. At least two, two, three, three hours daily. As you do that, your prophetic antenna will be sharp and you will always hear. He wants to speak to you. The Bible said in the book of Amos chapter 3 verse 7, when the Lord God do something except he reveal it. He wants to, he does not keep us in the dark. God is a speaking God right now. He is speaking. For example, anywhere you are now, there are radio waves. But if you don't tune to a particular radio FM of your church, you might not hear voices. So it is your duty to tune in and he will communicate. He will tell you what is happening now and what is to come and give you wisdom to operate in it. So I want to encourage you. I've been doing many of my teaching from this award-winning book. I wrote this book about a decade ago, The Mandated Prophet. I would like you to Google online, go to online stores and make a download and pay. It's, this book is anointed. I've seen people who read this book and they got baptized and they started prophesying. It's an anno- I, 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 I wrote this book from a depth of experience and encounter with the Holy Spirit. So look at it, mandated prophet. I would like you to get it for more explanation. I want to encourage you, comment, ask your questions on the comment section. Share this video, invite somebody, tell us how we have been of blessing to you. Please keep announcing this meeting and the Lord will cause you to grow and to cause you to manifest possibilities. Before I go, I would like to release blessings on you. I therefore release God's blessings upon your life. Blessed are, are thy eyes because they see. Blessed are thy ears because they hear. I command every blockage in your eyes to fall off. I command every ears that any blockage in your ears to fall off. I ask for a fresh consecration of your template. May God anoint you. I break every yoke of ancestral limitation. I command your heavens to open. Everyone hearing me that is a victim of demonic affliction, I command you to go. You will not be confused. You will not borrow to eat. The word of God and the burden of the Spirit shall fall afresh on you. Until I see you so, uh, until I see you next uh, same time next week, I would like you to keep burning for the Lord, keep occupying. I am Bishop Ogudin Emmanuel Eze, the presiding bishop of Zion Heritage and Miracle Ministries Abuja. So in case you come into the city of Abuja, feel free to worship with us. I and my wife have written over 75 books that can be a blessing to you. Follow me on Facebook with my name, Bishop Ogudin Emmanuel Eze. The Lord bless you. Thank you. Keep shooting. I love you. Bye-bye.